Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Pudang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami So these previous few weeks, we've been working through a set of verses from the Tibetan tradition called the Eight Verses of Mind Training. And they were composed in the, uh, about 800 or so years ago. I haven't memorized them yet, so I still have them on a piece of paper. And I think they best can be thought of as an extremely powerful, skillful means. In Buddhism, we have the concept of the eight worldly winds, praise, blame, gain, loss, pleasure, pain, fame, disrepute, which batter us from side to side in life. And in one sense, the worldly life is one spent chasing and running from these winds. This morning, someone asked me what the meaning of one who has gone forth is. As we chanted uh, last week, the 10 recollections for one who has gone forth. And while literally it refers to a renunciant uh, monastic who's gone forth from the home into the homeless life, Ajahn Amaro has frequently said that at a deeper level, one who has gone forth, one who is homeless, refers instead to a, or also, to a fundamental shift in our internal orientation from seeking refuge in this world, which is so transitory and slips through our fingers. Ceasing to look to it as a home, and instead looking to it as a lesson and a chance to give, and only that much. And instead, looking to, for refuge in the Dhamma, and in the teaching and practice, in this potential, which we can refer to as, um, well, the deathless element, which the Buddha exemplified for us. So in a sense, it's a stepping away from these worldly winds. And instead of spending our lives being buffeted by them and believing in them, instead looking at them as teachers, chances to refine our actions, intentions, and heart. Sometimes, however, the ability to step back and have perspective on the loss, the gain, the praise and the blame, the pleasure and the pain in our lives is not available completely. And in a sense, these eight recollections are ways of leaning into the worldly winds, of almost using them in an inverse way to achieve an actual sense of balance. They're almost like counterbalancing the winds the verses go as follows. One, by thinking of all sentient beings as more precious than a wish-fulfilling jewel, for accomplishing the highest aim, I will always hold them dear. Two, whenever I'm in the company of others, I will regard myself as the lowest among all, 
and from the depths of my heart cherish others as supreme. Three, in my every action, I will watch my mind, and the moment destructive emotions arise, I will confront them strongly and avert them, since they will hurt both me and others. Four, whenever I see ill-natured beings or those overwhelmed by heavy misdeeds or suffering, I will cherish them as something rare, as though I'd found a precious treasure. Five, whenever someone out of envy does me wrong by attacking or belittling me, I will take defeat upon myself and give the victory to others. Six, even when someone I have helped or in whom I have placed great hopes mistreats me very unjustly, I'll view that person as a true spiritual teacher. Seven, in brief, directly or indirectly, I will offer help and happiness to all my mothers and secretly take upon myself all their hurt and suffering. Eight, I will learn to keep all these practices untainted by thoughts of the eight worldly winds. May I recognize all things as like illusions and without attachment gain freedom from bondage. So we've moved through the first four before this. Verse five says, whenever someone out of envy does me wrong by attacking or belittling me, I will take defeat upon myself and give the victory to others. I think the most powerful way I've seen this manifest um, well, there's many moments in, in history where you see this. But sometimes we don't have the complete presence of mind to step back away when we are uh, attacked or belittled. And at times it can be helpful to really try to take, to just apologize, to take on the burden of some of the blame. Because rarely have we per behaved perfectly in any given situation. And instead acknowledge uh, that we're as practitioners embarking and working within the context of a much larger narrative of awakening. And that the vicissitudes of life, the ups and downs of what we go through are in a very real sense, the means by which we gain the wisdom and the humility towards awakening. And I'm struck by um, seeing how many of the spiritual giants in our history have been the ones who have gone through the most humbling experiences um, thinking of Nelson Mandela, who spent decades in prison before emerging, and somehow the grounding in a spiritual narrative above and beyond just the ups and downs of regular life is what ennobled all the actions he took after that and made him more than just a political activist in our history and in our eyes, but rather a saint in a sense. The next verse is similar. Even when someone I have helped or in whom I have placed great hopes mistreats me very unjustly, I will view that person as a true spiritual teacher.
this is a similar recollection in that it's the giving up of the tra traditional narratives we hold around others and really a level of surrender. And I'm struck by how this can relate very directly to meditation in that, in a sense, the whole world has this quality. We give ourselves so much to different parts of this world, to relationship, to career, to the people around us, to different hopes, even to our meditation practice. And so often, we end up betrayed or disappointed because we are relying on something that at its heart is unreliable, and this is the central insight that leads to stream entry for so many beings, is just seeing that conditioned things are impermanent and shift, that they are unreliable, that we re reach into a liquid expecting a solid again and again. And this is also, the difficulty is that the ways we have of recollecting this don't always have it sink in. In Buddhist thought, we have three types of wisdom. Um, sutta maya panya, which means wisdom gained from hearing, listening, or reading. Chinta maya, chitta maya panya, which is wisdom gained from thinking about the things we've read, understanding them, pondering them. And then bhavana maya panya, which is wisdom gained from practice. And bhavana maya panya is the unique and essential thing that meditation and the Buddhist path gives us in that where the body becomes stronger from movement, the mind becomes stronger from resting and not moving. Or one can think of it as if one is on a train and as long as the train and the mind are moving constantly, everything out the window is a blur. But as soon as we slow the train down, then suddenly we can discern forms and detail in the world around us. So similarly, these truths that the world is unreliable, that certain people while we can love and draw close to them and give to them, cannot serve as a refuge in the end for us. While we may think these things, at some deep level, the heart will not let go right away. And the terms samatha and vipassana are subject of a bit of controversy in the Buddhist world. Samatha means tranquility practice. It's meditation practices which bring the mind to calm, where vipassana is insight, seeing with wisdom into contemplated phenomena. And there's many famous quotes about how these are one and the same at times, or at least related. Uh, Ajahn Chah would say, Samatha and Vipassana are like two ends of a stick. You pick one up and the other side comes as well. And there's use in this conception. For example, when we practice breath meditation, we'll come to a refined state of the breath. For example, a point where observing just the coarse breath at the 
tip of the nose or the wind moving in and out of the lungs feels too coarse. And essentially that's seeing dukkha, that's insight, vipassana. And as one sees that, one lets go and awareness is allowed to rise and refine into, for example, a feeling of the energy of the breath moving around the body or perhaps a sense of light. And this is samatha. So these two work together. Mindfulness of breathing is both samatha and vipassana at the same time, moving towards calm. However, there is a real place for distinguishing these two in certain contexts as well. Because as one's mind grows deeply calm, it will rest for a time still. Perhaps one is uh, able to just keep a steady awareness on the breath like a thin thread uh, moving through the uh, nose or perhaps the glow of loving kindness has grown to the point where one is able to drop all words or images and just be with that warm feeling in the heart. But after a time of resting in that state, the mind will begin to move again. And it will do so inexorably. It will have had enough of resting and staying still. It's as if the samadhi glass or the glass of samatha tranquility is filled and it does not want to be filled anymore. And if one doesn't see this and just continues to try and calm the mind through traditional methods, it feels a bit like beating your head against the wall. So this is where one turns to a very explicit practice of vipassana, which is insight practice. And because the mind has rested for a time, it will usually be imbued with an afterglow, not just of a stillness which allows it to see clearly, as if the train had stopped for a time and suddenly one can look out the window and perceive detail, but also the happiness that the mind gains from resting in quiet. Because of that happiness, the mind is willing to perceive the fleeting and transitory nature of everything that surrounds it, but it can only see that when it feels safe and warm and held through the afterglow of an internal well-being brought about by samadhi or samatha. At one level, our mind knows that we're surrounded by a vortex of whirling conditions, but the only reason it does not see it is because it doesn't have an internal security that it could rest in if it gave up its grip on that, so it's unwilling to see clearly. So when the mind begins to move after resting in a time of calm is when we can explicitly bring up these flawed elements in the world. It's when we can contemplate clearly something, uh, say a relationship. And one can do several things around this. One can simply apply the three characteristics to any perception. The three characteristics or three perceptions being anicca, anatta, and dukkha, impermanent, suffering, or stress, stressful, and not self. So just looking at a something one is dependent on, something one is attached to, be it a career, a hope, a dream, a person, and just saying, this is not me. Um, this is not worth clinging to. This will pass. And if the mind's in a bright state, then this won't lead to a morbid depression, but rather to a sense of cooling, a sense of stillness, and a bright happiness in letting go. When one imagines what the Buddhist conception of the citta, or the heart, is, it's an unbelievably bright, luminous thing. It's our potential for awakening. And when one thinks that we constantly, this heart, which is so bright, constantly 
deludes itself into thinking that it is or is dependent upon all these other things, then inevitably that's going to darken something that is, has this immense brightness hidden in it or which has such potential for brightness. So that should be the sensation, not of losing something that one needs, but rather of a letting go, a cooling, a brightening, replacing the agitated, clinging energy of fire to a log with the cool, radiant, slow-burning feeling of light in space. And the most powerful um, way of applying this or using this period when the mind begins to move again is to look at the body. Because in a sense of all the things that we attach to, one of our most basic attachments of the five aggregates, the five khandas, is the body. And the delusion is so great that we don't really realize we are as deluded as we are. So, and if one reads the Tarigata or the Tarigata, the elder verses of the monks and nuns, they're filled with this insight, the breakthrough of the body, um, and just seeing that it's not worthy of attaching to completely as mine or me or myself. This is the insight which issued countless disciples into stream entry or their first taste of awakening. And it's not the cultivation of a negative body image which would come from comparing one's body to another body and thinking that one's body is less than that. It's rather seeing that all these bodies are in a sense mantles of clay, transitory and flawed, complex and impressive in their own right, but we give such importance and attachment to them. So when one's mind begins to move after resting in a period of calm, uh, one thing that is really useful is to bring up the 32 recollections, uh, the 32 parts of the body, which is a recollection the Buddha recommended where one lists different parts of the body, including the skin, the bones, the teeth, the nails, the hair. And you find one that interests you, that the mind looks at and becomes entranced by or interested in. And just investigate with the bones. One can just feel where one's bones touch the ground, say. Imagine the bones. What happens if they crumble, when they crumble? They return to earth. How are they different than stone, than calcium? And you come up with a contemplation. And if the mind truly has been imbued with this afterglow of power, of warmth and happiness and stillness, then it will see into these, this transitory phenomena of the body with bhavana maya panya, with a deep insight that feels different than thinking about something. And one might have a moment where one looks at an arm and sees it as just something which one is borrowing from the world, in a sense. We're cautious about talking about a suba practice, this practice of body contemplation with people, because if it leads to uh, a sense of depression, then the mind shouldn't go to it. it uh, it's not the correct contemplation, and one should return to a bright object such as metta. But it's a very useful tool to have because not only does seeing through the body uh, attenuate every defilement that's wound through our attachment to the body, it cools all the kalesas and it rips apart the sense of self in a nitty gritty way that the sort of high minded koans so often can't even touch. 
but also it helps cool. It gives us some tool to cool the fires of lust. And if the third precept of refraining from sexual misconduct and remaining faithful, if just that was held by the world, then so much suffering would be let, left behind. So having this ability to cool one's lust a little bit and keep it within bounds is very helpful. Similarly, with um, a world now rife with pornography, to the point I think a statistic is 52% uh, of divorces now um, have one partner referencing porn addiction as the main cause. So just having some ability to fight these other forces which are at play in our lives and which are buffeting us one way or the other. A suba doesn't have to be this dour practice. It can just be a way to cool the fires a little bit. And at its heart, it's a way for us to look past this veil of the body and see someone's heart. Ajahn Panyavado says about 90% of what we think about someone initially is from what we from their body image and what we see. And what a gift to be able to look past your own or another's beauty or perceived ugliness or imperfection, whatever it is, and just see them as a human being. So just as the sixth verse says, even when someone I have helped or in whom I have placed great hopes mistreats me very unjustly, I will view that person as a true spiritual teacher. You know, yes, we've spoken about many times about how we can actually apply this to people in our lives. Um, you know, and I've referenced before that year that I lived with a monk who would admonish me about everything and how my main practice for that year was realizing that if he was a well-renowned teacher advising me to shut the door more quietly, to pull up my socks, to clean out my drawer, to speak more quietly, I would take it as this beautiful opportunity to refine my behavior, to practice patience. But because he was just another monk, then suddenly it just became some guy talking to me and the source of aversion. So my whole practice that year was conceiving of him as a bodhisattva um, sent to teach me patience. And this is consistently the most powerful recollection I've seen for myself in regards to those who are difficult. But also, once again, because samsara as a whole, because this body our careers, our relationships are all these things that we've poured ourselves into and placed our hopes. When they inevitably don't live up to what we want them to, if we can see that as them trying to impart to us a lesson of letting go, specifically if we can look at them in the light afterglow of a calm meditative experience, and contemplate them from that space using vipassana, aiming towards bhavana mayapanya, wisdom from practice, then we can see clearly. And it's best not to wait until these things are in full fever for us to bring to mind these contemplations. We look through the body before it becomes sick. We contemplate the transitory nature of reality before things get bad, because this prepares us. And some have said that the whole of the Buddhist practice is, in a sense, just preparing for death. That sounds kind of morbid, but really, one can think that one is... All this can sound morbid if one thinks that this is just what there is. But it's important to recollect that there's something immutable in the human heart. And we don't have to attach that to some ontological, mystical truth necessarily. Although in Buddhism, Nibbana is considered a state beyond the conditioned realm. But just that there's something in our hearts which is immune or can be immune to conditions. 
and hold complete selflessness and love, regardless of what those around us do. And this is our aim. But it requires us to see with wisdom and let go of that which we've attached to. Seven, in brief, directly or indirectly, I will offer help and happiness to all my mothers and secretly take upon myself all their hurt and suffering. So in the Tibetan tradition, a common way of bringing the heart to a state of love is to remember that in the scope of samsara, rebirth, every being has been our mother and to bring them to mind with that same love. However, even if we don't believe in rebirth, to understand that all we have, in a sense, is gifts from others, that we exist in an interconnected state, and to appreciate what's been given to us and those who give it, And then I think there is this place here also for just acknowledging the actual role of our parents, not as a metaphor, but truly. Last uh, week, someone asked a question for the Wednesday live stream about they had a difficult relationship with their parent and were wondering if they were obligated to reach out again. They'd cut off all contact. And in the Buddhist conception, no matter how difficult our relationship with our parents was, we do owe them a debt, and it's a sacred relationship. And obviously, one has to take care of one's heart and see how deeply one can wade into a relationship again. And one can really navigate this and find the right balance by seeing how much interaction one can have with those difficult relationships of family and otherwise one can have while still maintaining a measure of goodwill, centeredness, mindfulness. And a good metric for this is if one's able to remain aware of one's body. Are you able to maintain awareness of the soles and the feet, of the hands? Or do you truly spin off? And if that's the case, then retreating a bit from that relationship and negotiating when and how you approach it. We have a tempting narrative in our culture to play the martyr. And it's useful and important to recollect that in the Buddhist conception, we are obliged to have the same loving kindness for ourselves that we have towards others. And to acknowledge that until awakening, we are very sick. Um, many teachers would say that the only sane people are the arahants. The rest of us are all kind of wandering around, bumping into one another. and especially if one has just come across the Dhamma after so many years of not having it, then one has to realize that, in a sense, one's whole life has been lived with this raw wound, and finally there's a chance for it to heal. And just to have an understanding of that, it takes time, and many people, as soon as they begin to hit deep states of concentration, what will happen is they'll begin to grieve and remember all the things they've done wrong over their life. that will replay, and it's a cleansing, in a sense. But that we have this backlog of trauma that we're unaware of until we step into a place of a little more well-being. And to just acknowledge that, especially at the beginning of practice, that drawing back from damaging or problematic relationships is not selfish. 
It's something we owe ourselves. And once we've taken care of ourselves, we can also take care of others. So, yes, if we can open up a relationship again with our parents, if we can give to them as much as we're able, that's good. But also to be aware of any sense of needing to martyr oneself or go more deeply than one feels one can. Ajahn Suchito frequently says, with trauma, you don't go in until you can stay out. And the eighth verse, I will learn to keep all these practices untainted by thoughts of the eight worldly concerns. May I recognize all things as like illusions and without attachment gain freedom from bondage. I find this a useful recollection because it's each of these verses in some senses relies on subverting the dynamic of a worldly wind, or many of them do. One approaches a relationship conceiving as, of oneself as the lowest of all. One gives victory to the other. One cares for others more than one cares for oneself. And there's a place for each of these to be used in skillful ways as a skillful means. But this final verse is the acknowledgement that that's what each of these are, just a skillful means. And that at the end of the day, one has to dissolve all these things into wisdom and a spaciousness. And this is the strange ox, uh, it's the juxtaposition of the path. It's the um, hard duality to understand in that when we practice there's a simultaneous stepping away from attaching and depending on these things in our lives and yet at the same time there's a stepping towards each of those things and in honoring them with utter or utmost care. It's as if we see one side, the wisdom, or one could think of it as, uh, the Buddha said he taught the Dhamma in the Vinaya. And in a sense, the Dhamma has much to do with the sense of wisdom, spaciousness, and letting go. But the Vinaya is an unbelievably detailed system of rules, regulations, ways that we interact and care for one another. And what's interesting about seeing someone develop on this path is how they hold everything so much more lightly, and yet at the same time with such care. It's the difference between holding, to use a metaphor that the Buddha uses uh, around breath meditation, actually, the difference between crushing a bird in the hand or holding it so tightly it can't move at all and suffocates versus holding it just lightly enough. Like Ajahn Chah said, we, we pick things up, but we pick them up lightly and know when to put them down. And yet, with that light grip, we can feel the nuance of something. We can feel the bird's breath. We can feel its energy. And even so, we can become especially attentive to each relationship in our life and care for it, even as we hold it more lightly. So this is how we both come into the world and step out of it at the same time. The Buddhist epithet for himself was the Tathagata, which means thus come and thus gone. Uh, because of a quirk in the Pali language, it means both come and gone. And the Buddha was a poet in some sense. And 
I think the beauty of this epithet is that it refers to this sense of simultaneous imminence and transcendence. How we transcend the world by seeing beyond it while at the same time embodying and playing out our role and following that pure voice of Dhamma and the path with more care than we would be able to otherwise, which is imminence. So I find these verses to be especially powerful in a very humbling way. And when I don't quite have the presence of mind to step completely outside of a difficult situation or one of blame or a loss, then using these recollections to almost lean into that wind and counteract the natural tendency to conceive of oneself as above others, as better than, as right, as wanting the victory. And instead, use these recollections to, for a second, occupy that place of humility, of surrender. These are powerful means we use to bring the mind to some deeper state of purity. So, thank you.